Hey friends, do you test your mixes in mono? Does mono compatibility even matter? I've seen a lot of rhetoric recently, especially in the music producer community, that the mono compatibility of a mix doesn't matter anymore, and that in these modern times, most folks are listening to music in perfectly fine stereo environments. So why bother with the dreaded mono check, and why bother ever using a phase correlation meter? In this video, we're going to explore this question thoroughly, and likely by the end, your mixing habits are probably going to change a little bit. Stereo is the default format of music creation and music delivery. However, that doesn't paint a whole picture. We also have to consider how music is actually consumed. More on that in just a second. What mono compatibility actually means is checking to see what happens when the left and right channels of a stereo mix are summed together into a single signal. Depending upon the mix, the effect of doing this can simply just make the mix sound less wide, or it can wreak utter havoc on the mix, rendering all of your hard work meaningless and leaving you feeling totally devastated. Let me show you some examples. Okay, so I've got two different mixes here. They have the same exact instruments in each one of them. However, the first mix I would consider to not be mono compatible, and the second mix I would consider to be mono compatible. So let's go ahead and listen to this first mix, which is not mono compatible. Now listening to this, you might think that this mix sounds perfectly innocent. It seems like the elements are decently balanced. There doesn't seem like there's necessarily anything wrong with this. But I wanna go ahead and show you something. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do the mono check. And this is really simple to do. I'm gonna get an Ableton Utility. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna drag this onto the master track and we're just gonna click this button. That's it, that's literally it. That's, that's the mono check, right? You're just taking the entire mix and you're summing the left and the right channel. Let's go ahead and listen to this mix again with it off and then I'm gonna switch it on. God. Crazy. So many things have changed about this mix. The bass is almost completely gone. The snare has reverb on it, but there's no reverb once I turn the utility on. The snare is completely dry. Listen again. When I turn the utility on, now, this mix is not mono compatible. That's the first thing to know. I'm going to turn this off and let's listen to the second mix. And this mix is what I would consider to be mono compatible. Let's take a listen. Without it. Now, of course, when you collapse a mix into mono, when you sum a mix into mono, it will immediately sound less impressive. There's less effect, there's less dimension, right? Because we're only dealing with one signal, okay? There's no panning, there's no space, right? It's collapsed. However, all the instruments, you can still hear each one of them. They still maintain a, a acceptable level of balance between them, okay? That's what I mean by mono compatible. I think the immediate thought for inexperienced musicians at this point is, wow, mono compatibility is such a waste of my time. If checking my mix in mono makes it sound worse, and the standard creation and delivery format of audio is in stereo, why would I ever do this? Well, now I'm gonna show you exactly why the mono compatibility of your mix is not only super important, but why it might be even more important now than it ever was before. It's not just my opinion, but physics and market trends have my back here. I've already mentioned how the standard creation and delivery format of audio is in stereo, but again, that doesn't complete the whole picture. The third and most frustrating factor is that not all people listen to your music in good stereo environments or even using stereo devices. During the very short time I decided to look into this, I discovered some rather disturbing and frustrating facts. The growth of the smart speaker market went from 7 to 35% of US homes using them. The most popular of these speakers are the Amazon Echo Dot and Google's Nest. And much to my dismay, and you might have guessed it, these speakers sum stereo to mono. And what this means is that if someone were to listen to the first mix that I played you, the mix would be utterly destroyed. Now to be fair, most smart speakers can be paired together in stereo. But think about it, do most consumer level people decide to buy a second speaker? And if they do, can you be sure that they have their speakers set up correctly? 
Most of the pairing options for these speakers actually have a stereo mode, but they can also be ran in dual mono. Can we really trust them to properly set their speakers up? Do most of them probably just default to one speaker because it's got clearer vocals and deeper bass and a more vibrant sound? What does vibrant sound even mean? One of the main reasons that you should do a mono check is because there is way more end user error than anyone wants to admit. Not everyone is sitting directly between two studio monitors or using high-end headphones, and that's why it's so important to get your mix as widely compatible so that it can translate as well as it can, no matter what speakers or what system it's coming out of. Hey. So before we get to reason number two, I just wanted to let you know that I offer some insanely robust and thorough courses on Ableton Live, not only in songwriting and sound design and in live performance, but also in mixing and mastering. I have a whole section specifically dedicated to the stereo field that will help you understand how to get the optimal results when it comes to mixing your music. And right now we're running a sale because I'm happy to announce that we now have a custom bundle builder where you can choose which one of your courses that you'd wanna take and save when you combine them all together. So if you want to learn more and check out the sale, you can look up here or down in the description and in the comments. Awesome. Let's get back to it. Now, the next reason that mono compatibility is actually increasing in importance is that the main vector for music discovery these days is, whether we like it or not, in short form content in which a smartphone is held vertically. When using social media like TikTok and Instagram, your smartphone is oriented vertically, and iPhones, as well as many other phones, have it so that the left and the right speaker are also now vertical when you're holding your phone that way. Now, the last time I checked, human ears are actually oriented horizontally. So whatever stereo information that is in that mix becomes skewed and less easy to hear. But even more problematic is that while smartphones and computer speakers do play in stereo for the most part, since the speakers are so close together, actual phasing issues can be present, especially when you crank them up and step further away from the device. Now, of course, you're not gonna get a perfect phase cancellation in this use case, but you're definitely going to experience a vastly different picture of the mix if you have wildly out of phase signals. When we mix, we're dealing with small incremental changes to get that mix to sound perfect, right? like one decibel here or two decibels there, is it really that much extra work to just occasionally check the mix in mono to ensure that it's not gonna get totally wrecked on a small device? So the next important reason to check your mix in mono is club PA systems. I can't tell you how many times we went on tour into small clubs just to test the PA system and discover that the entire thing was set up in mono. While it is true that this is becoming less and less of a thing in modern times, it still happens. What is very common, however, is that in many smaller clubs, they'll run their subs in mono because it's easier to get more bang for the buck that way. You get more SPL, you can get the subs to be louder when they're all in phase with each other. Also, while it's more common for PA systems to have their crossovers or low pass filters set at 120 hertz and below, depending upon the system, they could be set as high as 150 hertz. So lots of stereo out of phase information down low can be very problematic because it will cause wild fluctuations in how the bass is reproduced. This, along with the simple fact that when two speakers are in phase, it's easier to create more sound pressure, is why you see so many bass mono options in modern devices and plugins. Long story short, if you want heavy or loud bass, you'll make the most of any PA system if your low end or sub is mainly in phase most of the time. It's just how physics works. Hey, so the final and maybe not so obvious reason why mixing in mono or checking your mix in mono is optimal sometimes is when it comes to achieving separation. When you have a stereo signal, it's really easy to just simply pan one instrument or element of your mix this way and another element that way and then call it separated. But as we've seen, this really doesn't achieve much at all for listeners who might not be in the optimal position or not listening through an optimal system. So in a lot of ways, panning is kind of the least important thing when it comes to separation. When you collapse your mix down to mono and listen to it that way, two things are immediately obvious. The first one would be level. If you're listening to just one signal, it's really easy to hear level issues. If you actually have a balanced mix, when you listen to your mix in mono, it will be immediately apparent which instruments might be too loud or too quiet. That's the most basic one. But I think the most powerful one is when it comes to frequency content. If you collapse your mix down to mono and you listen to all your instruments together, it becomes even more apparent which instruments are making similar frequency content or which instruments might be battling for space when it comes to their spectral or frequency content. So it's really easy to collapse your mix down to mono, listen to your mix, 
and choose, okay, I want this element to be dominant in this frequency area, I want this element to be dominant in this frequency area. A lot of folks refer to this process as frequency slotting, where you're just simply choosing which instruments are dominant where. If you do this action where you're choosing which instrument is dominant where, and then you listen to your mix in stereo again, you'll be mind blown as to how much more your mix will open up and how much clearer everything will sound. And while, yeah, this isn't necessarily a technical tip, this is more of a subjective thing. This is something where you are forcing yourself to listen to the mix from a new perspective, and this will help you make better decisions. Speaking of physics, I keep tossing around the term in phase and out of phase. What is meant in this context is the phase of a waveform. When you look at a wave, you have peaks and valleys, right? When you have a stereo waveform, you have left and right waveforms. These waveforms can either be in phase like this, or they can be out of phase with each other like this. Now, it's not bad if these waveforms or if speakers are doing different things. The entire perception of stereo is when one speaker or one channel of the stereo signal is doing something different than the other speaker or channel. If the channels are doing exactly the same thing, then the experience for the listener is essentially mono. What we're concerned with in this video, however, is when we sum the left and right speaker signals together. If we sum a stereo waveform into mono, we're literally adding these waveforms together. Let's take a stereo wave where the left channel is peaking at plus one, and the right channel has a valley at negative one. If you remember math class, then the sum of these numbers together is actually zero. This is exactly what happens when you have wildly out of phase signals. Like in the first mix, we get sounds disappearing altogether because the sum of those waveforms together is what? It's zero, essentially silent. Now again, signals or speakers doing different things isn't bad. In fact, it's how we get a signal to be stereo or how we get a signal to sound wide. Stereo, of course, is pleasing and exciting to listen to. We don't want to avoid speakers doing different things. What we actually want to avoid is speakers doing opposite things or near opposite things. In the stereo field, there is a gigantic difference between doing different things and doing opposite things. So in this first mix, when we sum it to mono, we are getting a lot of phase cancellation. But even folks that have been mixing for decades still use the mono check because it's not always immediately obvious when there are out of phase signals. And I've already showed you how to use the mono test. That's just switching on the mono switch here using Ableton Utility. But there's another tool that I wanna point out to you that uh, will really benefit a lot of you, especially you beginners who are having trouble getting your sounds to be mono compatible. And it's called the goniometer. Let's go ahead and drag this onto the master track after the utility. I'll go ahead and turn off my mono check utility for now. And let's look at this first mix and, and check out what the goniometer is showing us. Now here we see these familiar numbers again, negative one, zero, and positive one. What this at the bottom of the goniometer is actually called is a phase correlation meter. What this is measuring is the difference between the left and the right channel, okay? It's showing you how correlated the left or the right channel's phase is. Okay, this is so useful because when I'm just watching this goniometer, I could look at this goniometer without listening to the music at all and I could tell you that this mix is not mono compatible. And the reason I can tell you that is because I can see that for the most part, when we're watching this mix, we're going below zero, okay? We're going into the space where we have opposite signals, okay? If this says negative one right here, we are essentially creating opposite signals. And again, when you have opposite signals and you bounce them down to mono, bad stuff happens, right? So again, take a listen. In this first mix, because there are so many elements that are opposite phase, we're getting total phase cancellation, okay? And that's what this meter down here shows you. Now, you don't have to use the goniometer. It's a free Max for Live device, which I think most folks can take advantage of, but you can also use uh, Ozone Imager, which has a phase correlation meter, and then there are a bunch of free phase correlation meters in uh, different uh, free plugins that are out there. But in this case, using a phase correlation meter can really show us what's happening in the mix. Now, before I was talking about the difference between different things and opposite things, if I pan this mix all the way to the left, the panning or the balance on a utility is after the mono. So what will happen is, is everything will be along this line right here. Check it out. 
I think when we think of stereo, we think of things being all the way over to the left or all the way over to the right. There's actually a difference between things being fully panned and then things having sideband material versus mid material. See, there's an M and an S here. Essentially, stereo audio can be divided two different ways. We can either look at the left and the right channel, which is what we're used to looking at, or we can also look at what's called the mid and the side material. The easy and incorrect way to define mid and side is to say that all the mid material is all the mono stuff and the side is all the stereo stuff. That's actually not true. What the mid actually is, is the phase correlated material between the left and the right speaker. And what the side material is, is all the opposite material, the complete 180 out of degree, out of phase signals. Okay, that's what the side signal is. Okay, when you combine the mid and the side together, you get a nice stereo image, right? What the goniometer is showing us is that we're seeing left, we're seeing right, we're seeing mid, and then we're seeing side, okay? So when I turn this utility off, we can see that there's a lot more sideband material than there is mid material, right? Watch. Now, let's go to this second mix and watch the goniometer now. Now on this goniometer, I would consider this area and this area to be essentially the safe areas where we want the audio to mainly stay for most of our music, for most of the tracks, for most of the sounds that we have in our music, we want it to be in this, what I would consider safe area. That doesn't mean all of your sounds have to be in that area, and it's really fun every once in a while to inject really wide, crazy sounds into your mix. There's nothing wrong with that. But you'll notice down here, the most important part about all this is the phase correlation meter is staying between zero and plus plus one, okay? This meter is showing us that when we collapse this mix down to mono, let's go ahead and do that. Even though we're occasionally dipping below zero, we still are getting a nice representation and a nice balance of all of our different tracks, okay? So let's get into a really practical use case for this. Let's go into these random keys. So right now in these keys, I'm using what's called the Haas effect to make a little bit of stereo. Let's take a listen to this. That's with the Haas effect with this delay. And then if I turn it off, we get a mono signal, right? Now let's go back to session view and look at the meter. Check out what happens when I collapse this signal to mono. It's significantly quieter, isn't it? Now, if I went really hard and made this fully wet, meaning that we have a delayed signal between the left and the right speaker, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get comb filtering when I actually collapse this down to mono. Take a listen. Right, we can see that it's actually gotten a lot quieter. So one thing that you can do to sort of mitigate this problem is first of all, when you're using stereo effects, try to avoid making them totally wet. It's not always beneficial to do that. The second thing that you can do is you can actually use a utility to try to mitigate this problem. So I'm gonna leave this utility here and let's load up a second one. In the second utility, what I can do is I can actually work with the width of this signal and then get it to be phase correlated. Let's also grab our goniometer and now between these two devices, this can help us make some good decisions. So let's go ahead and turn our dry wet all the way up and let's say that this was our setup. When I play this signal and the utility isn't doing anything at the moment, take a look at the goniometer. Now you can see that we're kind of remaining a little bit below zero for most of the time. I think in general, a good general rule, and of course general rules in audio are not always things you should follow, but for the most part, remaining below zero for a lot of your mix is gonna make it so that when you collapse to mono, a sound is gonna get a lot quieter. Okay, watch. Essentially, the mid aspect of this sound is a lot quieter than the side aspect of this sound. Okay, and so because of that, we can use this utility right here to try to boost the mid part of it. So one thing we could do is turn the width down, for example, and then we could turn the gain up a little bit. And now let's take a listen to this.
And now that I've done this, I've added a 5 dB boost and turned the width down, we can see that the level of the track is pretty similar. Another thing that you can do, and I should point this out too, is if you right click on this knob, you can go to what's called mid side mode. And in mid side mode, we can choose to actually change the blend between the mid and the side. And maybe this would help us get a more accurate result here. Go ahead and reset my gain, and let's go ahead and do this. So now let's listen to the difference. So you can see that using the goniometer and then using this utility has really helped me figure this out. Now I'll turn on my mono collapser and let's take a listen to the difference that this has made. That signal now sounds similar in its volume, okay? So this is how the goniometer and a utility plugin can really help us rein in sounds that are really phase uncorrelated, as well as help us identify when we have signals that are unphase correlated. Now, I think the general assumption is that in order to remain mono compatible, your mix has to be less wide sounding. And hopefully from this example, you can see that that's just not true at all. You can get insanely wide and deep sounding tracks if you take the time to actually understand the stereo field and how to bend and manipulate it to your will. Now, to be fair, if the end user is wearing headphones, the phase of each speaker is completely isolated from the other. Along with the rise of mono smart speakers and vertical phone use, there's also a rise in consumer Bluetooth headphone use. In the case of headphones, mono compatibility won't present the same issues. And I would argue that you could do some really fun stuff with this, like making it sound like the singer is behind you. In Nine Inch Nails song, Ruiner, that comes to mind because in the chorus, Trent Reznor's voice sounds like he's literally right behind you, whisper singing in your ear, and it has this like really creepy effect. I've always been of the mind that what are the use of these modern tools if we can't explore wildly creative ways to use them? I'd even go as far as to say that maybe your fans would enjoy and support a high dynamic headphone mix release where you purposely focus on wild psychoacoustic out of phase versions of your tunes and you don't worry about loudness or mono compatibility. I actually think that there's also an added benefit to doing like direct to fan kinds of releases where you're using like Bandcamp or SoundCloud or whatever, because not every single song needs to be released on Spotify. You can kind of like stick it to the man that way, right? And so to that end, I'm not saying that all of your sounds in your mix should be perfectly mono compatible. In fact, I think it's fun to toss in totally out of phase sounds into the mix from time to time to disorient the listener and have fun with folks wearing headphones. But the main thing is to totally ignore mono compatibility because you think that everyone should listen to your music in perfect stereo environments is kind of alienating an increasingly large percentage of listeners. So given what you know now, Hopefully you'll remain skeptical of plugins and effects that create super impressive ultra wide sounds. Listening environments can also skew audio and create phasing issues, but the mono check will never lie to you. Awesome. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this kind of thing, like, comment, subscribe. Much love everybody. I'll see you next time.